All right, hi everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I'm Elena Traster in the Environmental Studies Department here at MCLA, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Green Living Seminar presentation. Our Green Living Seminar this semester is organized around the theme, Capitalism and the Environment. All of these presentations are free and open to the public. They take place here in the MCLA Feigenbaum Center for Science and Innovation, room 121. Uh, you can find the schedule and links to recordings of prior presentations on our website at www.mcla.edu slash greenliving. Our presentation day will last about 45 minutes or so and be followed by a question and answer session. So do remember uh, your questions to ask then um, and maybe, maybe peppered throughout. We'll see. Um, a quick plug for next week's presentation. We hope you'll also come back next week Wednesday, March 8th, Christina McCune, climate forester with the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, will give a lecture titled Economics of Climate Smart Forestry. Today's presentation titled Climate Economics and Policy will be given by Dr. Matthew Gibson, Associate Professor of Economics at Williams College. Thanks so much. Thank you kindly, Professor Traster. Thank you all of you for coming to spend a little bit of your evening with a representative of what was uh, once called by a pro-slavery politician, the dismal science. Roughly speaking, this will be a story in three parts. So I'm going to start by saying something about how an economist thinks about climate change. There is some professional deformation likely occurring here, meaning I'll use some impenetrable jargon at some point. If that happens, please do raise your hand and say, what on earth do you mean, sir? And I'll, I'll do my best to clarify. Also, if you have a question at any point, I, I generally encourage my students to participate to any degree short of outright heckling. So if you've got something to say, I'd be interested in hearing about it from you. Uh, second part of the story has to do with policy. Economists tend to like to recommend what we call first best, that's a telling euphemism, and, or efficient policies. These are frequently market-based policies. So you've heard of carbon taxes or cap and trade systems. Empirically, these policies either do not happen or do not work. So I'll say something about the inadequacy of market-based policy, and that leads naturally to the question, if we can't have market-based policy, or we don't want to have it, what should we do instead? So I'll talk a little bit about alternative policy approaches to the greenhouse gas pollution problem, and then say something just a, a little bit about adaptation. How should we think about how human beings will respond to the climate change that we either cannot avoid or have chosen not to avoid? But the first part of that story, how does an economist think about the greenhouse gas pollution problem? This is a figure I've taken from a standard textbook. If it looks daunting, fear not, we'll work through this together. It says here particulate abatement, but you can substitute for that greenhouse gas abatement, and the rest of the picture still applies. So what on earth is going on here? Our vertical axis is just dollars per ton. So in, in our context, that's dollars per ton of CO2, or CO2 equivalent, right? Other gases, methane, et cetera. I know that those of you who are environmental studies majors know about the other greenhouse gases. On our horizontal axis, we have got abatement. And this is, if you've not met it before, it's a funny concept, but it's sometimes easier to think about emissions reductions rather than emissions. So abatement is the opposite of emissions. If we're doing zero abatement, that means we're emitting a lot. Let the CO2 rise into the sky. If we are doing lots of abatement, that means we are emitting very little. We are avoiding emissions. That's just the setup of the axes. On in, in this plane, we've got two objects we care about. This upward sloping supply curve, this is a cost curve. If we do abatement, if we choose not to emit, but instead, let's say, siphon some greenhouse gases out of our stack at a plant and sequester them in the ground, that costs extra money. And that money is represented by this upward sloping cost curve. Notice it starts here, not at zero. This picture assumes there is no free abatement. If we want to reduce emissions, that has at least some cost, even at very low levels. Here, that's labeled A. As we do more and more abatement, meaning we emit less and less, the marginal cost is increasing. What does that mean? 
each subsequent unit of abatement is more expensive than the previous one. So maybe the first unit of abatement only costs us A, but the second unit, let's say two is here, costs us A plus some amount. We've risen a little bit. By the time we are way out here, we're doing lots of abatement, maybe we have a goal of, of net zero, we're trying to drive emissions all the way to zero, the cost of that last unit of GHG abatement could be quite high. I'm not tall enough to reach it and point at it, but hopefully my green dot has done the trick. So I'm not taking a stand on the exact height of this curve, but this shape is something empirically that we often see if we think about pollution abatement. There's some stuff we can do quite cheaply. It's, not, it's even not unheard of to have negative cost for very low levels of pollution abatement. That is, there might be some super low-hanging fruit that we could get that would actually save us money in other parts of our production process. But it's common that we exhaust the low-hanging fruit at some point, and eventually we get into a region of expensive abatement. That's the cost side of things, but you know economists love this on the one hand, on the other hand sort of thing. So if we have costs on my left hand, we need benefits on my right hand. What are the benefits of abating greenhouse gas pollution? If I avoid a unit of emissions that would otherwise have happened, or if I, who's heard of the, the big carbon capture and sequestration plant that's operating in Iceland? Anyone seen pictures of this? So imagine we're a participant in that facility. We, we siphon a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere and we store it in a way that we think is credible in perpetuity, or at least a human being's idea of perpetuity. What's the benefit of doing that? I actually am hoping you will answer. Sometimes I hold my students hostage. I say, I will not continue until somebody volunteers an answer. <laughs> this is a favorite response of my students as well. <laughs> Suppose we suck a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere and we bury it somewhere forever. It never comes out. What's the benefit of doing that? Why would we do that? Ah, not the answer I was fishing for, but sure. Right? It, it could be the case that we remove a ton of CO2 and that allows us to manufacture an ambulance that takes people to the hospital. That could be plausibly a socially very high value thing to do. And maybe in the absence of the carbon capture, we wouldn't have been able to do that. But Suppose we stick with our removal. We suck the ton out and we don't replace it. What's the benefit then? Yes? It would be in the hopes of not just halting uh, the acceleration of climate change, but perhaps reversing it to a more, to a similar way as, you know, pre-industrial or closer to that. Yes, yeah, so, so this is what I was fishing for, although both answers are, are correct and interesting. So, if we reduce emissions relative to a counterfactual, relative to what would have happened otherwise, then we get less climate change than we would have otherwise, and less climate damage, less damage to human beings and the social systems we all participate in. So that's the, the benefit of greenhouse gas abatement, avoided climate damage. So the benefit of abatement is represented by this downward sloping curve. It's labeled MWTP. We don't need to get into what, what that represents. You can think of it as a demand curve for abatement. It starts high and ends low as we move from left to right. So if we start out not doing any abatement at all, and then we do our first unit of abatement, we suck that first ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere, the benefit of that might be very, very high. But we typically assume that there are uh, diminishing, diminishing returns to a good thing. So as we do more and more abatement, one unit more, one unit more, we run into diminishing marginal benefit. So the, the last ton of abatement we do helps humans and social systems less than the first ton of abatement. Once we have these two elements in place, marginal cost, marginal benefits, economists typically then like to find the intersection of these two curves, point C on this figure, and we say, aha, we have arrived at the optimal, in scare quotes, policy. What does optimal mean in the typical economic formulation? It means efficient, 
that sort of doesn't answer the question, what does efficient mean? Colloquially, we are maximizing the size of the social pie. If we ignore how well-being is distributed, we just want to make society as a whole as well off as possible, this analysis would say we do that by abating up to this point on the horizontal axis where marginal benefits and marginal costs of abatement are equal. How do we know this maximizes the size of the pie? Well, we typically think about what happens if you deviate. Imagine I start at this point, and then I do one more unit of abatement, meaning I shift one unit on the horizontal axis to the right. Is that a winner? Does my welfare improve? Well, the marginal cost of that last unit of abatement past Q star is here, and the marginal benefit is lower. It's here, which means that last unit of abatement past Q star was a loser in welfare terms. I've actually reduced the size of the pie because I did something where the cost outweighed the benefit. So it can't be efficient in this pie maximizing sense. Same thing if I imagine starting at Q star and moving one unit to the left. If I stop abating here, I've stopped at a point where benefits are greater than costs. That means I haven't squeezed all of the juice out of the lemon, if you'll pardon the sort of lame metaphor. I could do more abatement, and the, the benefit of that one more unit would still be greater than or equal to the cost. So I can't be maximizing the pie if I stop short of Q star either. Pie maximizing point must be at Q star. You, if you haven't seen this kind of picture before, it's not at all natural to think about. Question from anyone? Okay, you can always ask later if it comes to you. Yes. Mm. Okay, this, this is an excellent question. So the, the, in case you didn't all hear, the question is about the, fa the fact that benefits and costs are accruing over time. And of course, in climate change scenarios, this is a, a non-ignorable consideration. A lot of the costs that we might bear to do GHG abatement happen today. Imagine this plant outside Reykjavik siphoning CO2 out of the atmosphere. If we want that to happen today, we pay those costs today. But the benefits in, in terms of avoided climate change and avoided damages happen this year, next year, and every year into perpetuity. So if we want to apply a picture like this, which is fundamentally static, meaning it ignores time to an analysis of climate change, we need for both the benefits curve, this downward sloping object, and the cost curve, this upward sloping curve, to be the present value of all, all current and future costs and benefits. So this has to be the present value of all costs, and this has to be the present value of all benefits. What's present value mean? Think of it as like a currency conversion. I can convert dollars to euros. I can convert benefits or costs that are happening 100 years from now into today's money using a kind of exchange rate. The term we typically use is a discount rate or discount factor. So I'm hiding that. It does matter quite a bit. The kind of curve I will draw here, especially for marginal benefit, avoided climate damage, is going to be highly sensitive to how I convert those 100 years from now damages to human beings into today's dollars. If I use a high discount rate, then benefits that happen 100 years from now rate almost not at all in today's money. If I recall the, the example I do for my class correctly, if we use a 5% discount rate, and some famous economists do this, then we wouldn't be willing to pay even one cent today to avoid a dollar of climate damage in 100 years. That is, we apply our, our really stiff conversion, our really harsh conversion from dollars 100 years from now to dollars today. If, on the other hand, you use uh, Nicholas Stern, this British economist, uses, if I recall correctly, about a 2% discount rate, might be 1.5 then you'd be willing to pay 37 cents today to avoid a dollar of damages 100 years in the future. So the way you take stuff that happens over time and squish it down or project it into this static model really, really matters for what the model will say about where the efficient level of abatement is. If you use a low discount rate like Stern does, you take the future more seriously, 
That's going to say we should do more abatement today. If you use a high discount rate, meaning you're downweighting the future, the economist William Nordhaus of Yale frequently does this in his models, then things that happen in the far future receive much lower weight. I want to say something next about estimating this downward sloping thing. We have a lot of data, and indeed we're awash in it. I'd say the signal to noise ratio is pretty bad sometimes. What do we get if we actually try to estimate climate damage? Because after all, the benefit of mitigation policy is avoided climate damage. These are all taken from Berkshong and Miguel, Nature 2015. And don't worry, I'm not going to talk about every object on here. First up, this upper left panel, panel A, this is showing us income losses over time relative to a world without climate change. And these authors' preferred estimates are large. So here we have time running forward from the present out to 2100. And we're looking at what happens to GDP per capita. The author's central prediction is represented by this black line. And I believe this is under RCP 8.5, Representative Concentration Pathway 8.5, also known frequently as business as usual, where we, we keep on emitting GHGs with, with very little regard to the impact on, on others and on the future. These authors estimate that if we keep doing that by 2080, we will have reduced gross domestic, gross domestic product, meaning output or income, by about 25% on a per capita basis. Show of hands, is that a small number? Is that a big number? I think most of us would agree that is a big number. If you, if you disagree, that's totally fair. I asked a completely normative, subjective question. But really, in climate economics, there is no getting away from normative or subjective elements of the analysis. If somebody tells you they have taken a purely positive approach, simply describing what is without taking any stand on what should be, they may be deceiving you. There are a couple implications of this. Oh, well, yeah, actually, there are three things I want to say here. Uncertainty is a primary feature of any analysis of climate change. I highlighted the central estimate that's given by this black curve but these authors have done a really nice job of representing the uncertainty in their estimate with this red shaded band. For those of you who have a little bit more of the statistical background, this is a confidence interval, but it's not one that assumes symmetry. So darker regions of this red shaded band are probabilistically more likely, and light shaded regions have some positive prob probability attached to them, but it's lower. Notice that the uncertainty here is not symmetric, right? There, there is some positive probability of per capita income actually increasing under climate change, but the light color tells us it's very low. In contrast, most of the dark red color is concentrated either just above the central estimate, a region like this is still talking about a 10% per capita income loss, which I would say subjectively is big. Also on the table, we have a dark red region here where we're talking about per capita income losses approaching 50%. That's a really big deal. I'm gonna flip forward for just a moment because I don't remember how I structured this. Okay. Do human beings like risk? I see some horizontal shaking heads. I see some vertical shaking heads. Clearly, some human beings like risk. My favorite dad joke example is Alex Honnold. Who's familiar with this cat? I see some nods. So th this is the, the man who like, likes climbing rock faces with no ropes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, he, so he, he's famous for doing routes in, in Yosemite. This man plausibly likes risk. He would be willing to pay money to take more risk. Indeed, he does, right? He's got to pay to get into Yosemite. He's got to pay for fuel for his van, for climbing equipment. He's paying money in order to take more risk. Alex Honnold is not typical. Indeed, he is studied by scientists because his risk preferences are so unusual. 
Most human beings, if you put them in a lab and give them choices that involve more or less risk, are willing to give up resources to take less risk. That's a revealed preference vote for in, in favor of them not liking risk, right? If you liked risk, you wouldn't be willing to give up stuff to avoid it. Most of us do this actually all the time in, in our daily lives. So think, think of common human life risks. Your house could burn down. A member of the philosophy department could back her car into the side of your car. Ask me how I know. Or you could fall ill and need expensive medical care. So what do we typically do in order to manage risks like that? Say the healthcare example. I face a lot of risk over my health. What do I do to manage that risk? Buy insurance. Yes. So it's not the only possible answer, but it was indeed the answer I was fishing for. I, I might buy insurance. And that is exactly giving up something, my insurance premium, in order to lessen the risk I face. What's the implication of that sort of thinking for climate policy? Well, this red shaded band is telling us there is a lot of income risk associated with climate change. That's not a vote, at least in an economic analysis, that's not a vote for doing less, saying, ah, we're not sure, nobody knows anything, we can't do anything. The implication is just the opposite. If our best guess is climate change is really bad, but there's also a lot of uncertainty around that, we should actually do more, not less. We should be buying insurance by abating more. And that could either be avoiding emissions in the first place or siphoning them out of the atmosphere. The second thing to say about this empirical estimate of the damage has to do with how it differs over rich and poor countries. If you look at the richest 20% of countries as of 2010, the central estimate for damage for them is, is very close to zero, and this is mostly driven by Europe. Europe is very far to the north, it started the industrial era with very cool temperatures, and so it has a lot of room to heat up before things start getting bad. In contrast, if we look at the poorest 20% of countries using 20, 2010 incomes, this is where you see 75% declines in income per capita projected. I don't know if that will come to pass. I don't know if poor countries are going to lose 75% of their income per capita. But what I will say is it's very hard for any of us to credibly predict what will happen to a human society if you knock out 75% of its income per capita. We've seen quite extreme social phenomena in response to slowing income growth or smaller income declines than this. What happens to a group of human beings when that much of their market livelihood vanishes? I may say things like this several times during the class, but if somebody tells you for sure that they know what that world looks like, I, I would say they're probably overconfident. The last point I want to, want to make here has to do with this panel. And this is just to say that different climate modelers and different economists come up with different damage numbers. None of them are crazy. They're making different assumptions. They may be using different data sets. These three projections with the dashed lines, where they're grouped under IAMs, this integrated assessment model. I don't really care about that jargon. But if you've heard of Bill Nordhaus, of the DICE model, these were the first attempts by economists to staple a climate system model to an economic model and see how bad climate damage was going to be they tend to produce small numbers, 3%, 5% losses in income per capita. In contrast, you get the damages we've already talked about from this study, which is Berkshong and Miguel 2015. I'm not saying necessarily that Berkshong and Miguel are right and that the integ integrated assessment modelers are wrong. Instead, what I'm saying is there is uncertainty about climate damage coming not just from how shall I say? Not just from uncertainty within a given model, but from uncertainty across models. The red band here was telling us about uncertainty within the model used by a single paper. This is telling us that different papers also give us different numbers. So the risk is even greater in magnitude than the red band told us. 
And that, again, is an argument for doing more, not less, buying ourselves some insurance. The economist most in, associated with this insurance view is, is Martin Weitzman, Marty Weitzman. You may or may not have heard of his book, Climate Shock. It's much, much better than the competing Nordhaus book, Climate Casino. I'll say just a little bit about some work I've done with co-authors. This is a, a very small piece of the damage function, but it's one that's perhaps talked about a bit less than others. When economists first started thinking about damage from climate change, they naturally focused on the agricultural sector. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, agricultural is, agriculture is very obviously climate exposed. If you make plants too hot, they die. If you deprive them of water, they die. And workers in agriculture do most, though certainly not all of their work, either exposed to the sun, fully outdoors, or in a non-climate controlled space. So we expect heat stress on human beings who are participating in the agricultural sector. The second reason ag was typically the first thing we looked at is that it's a huge part of national income or output in low, lower income countries. Some colleagues, friends, and I have recently been thinking about construction in addition to agriculture, it's quite obviously climate exposed. I, I feel really like Captain Obvious when I turn to my students in class and say, I've learned that construction takes place outside. But it does. Why do we care about this? Well, partly just because it's 5% of the economy. If you damage it, that's something that may matter. But maybe even more importantly, construction is a capital producing sector. That is. When we think about how we make stuff, economists usually imagine we take some labor, we take some capital, we combine them somehow, and we get goods and services that human beings want. Why does this matter? Well, this actually goes back to maybe the most fundamental question in economics, or certainly a fundamental question in, in economics. How do countries get richer? Empirically, they have. If we compare people alive in the United States today to those of 1910, we enjoy much, much higher levels of consumption. Whether that's the same as well-being, separate question. But incomes grow over time. How does that happen? Well, two ways. Technological change. We get better at making stuff with a given stock of labor and capital. But two, we accumulate labor and capital. Population, not always, but often grows. And we pile up capital, meaning we build the building today, it's around for 30 years or 50 years. We build a drill press or a hydraulic press or an assembly line, those machines are around for a long time. So part of the way countries get wealthier is the growth of the capital stock and construction's part of that. But if climate damages productivity in the construction sector, then building capital will grow more slowly over time and that's going to lead to large long run climate impacts. So this is a draft calculation. I do not inscribe this in stone or, or sear it on your retinas, but this is an attempt to look at how construction productivity responds to heat. So we're looking at percentage change in output per worker on our vertical axis. This is daily temperature in degrees Celsius. I should say the outcome is measured at the annual level. So the way to interpret this figure is as follows. The best temperature for construction product productivity is about 12 degrees C. That's when we see the highest output per worker. If we take one day that's 12 degrees C and instead make it 40 degrees C, I realize that's extreme, but imagine we do that, then we lose something like 0.1% of output per worker for the entire year. Now that sounds very, very small, right? 0.1%, who cares? But that's changing the temperature on just one day. So if we heat up all days, and a reasonable projection for mean surface temperature in North America in 2100 is it'll be about five degrees C hotter, if I recall correctly. If we plug that projection into this model, we get something like a 9% decrease in output per worker. And that, that's actually a consequential hit to the productivity of the construction sector. Workers aren't as good at making buildings because they're hot, their bodies are stressed, maybe they have more difficulty focusing mentally, there are a lot of possible pathways there. What's the result over time? 
Well, I said that it slows down the accumulation of capital in the economy, and that's what this first panel is doing for us. The green line is a traditional climate economy model. It's the, the Nordhaus Dice model that I've talked about a couple times. In the Nordhaus model, the capital stock isn't affected very much by climate change, even if we go all the way out to 2200. In contrast, if you account for the fact that the, the construction sector is more damaged by climate change than, say, the manufacturing sector or the services producing sector, we get this very steep decline in the capital stock. The result then in terms of consumption is in the long run, consumption's much lower than it would be if we assumed the construction sector was affected in the same way as other sectors. So this is less important than the stuff I showed you before. Reducing per capita consumption by 25% is the big story here. This is just one piece of that in the construction sector to make things a bit more grounded, concrete. So we're not just living with this high level number in an anodyne way and forgetting that these are actual human beings we're talking about. This is a mathematical object, but what it is saying is that if we heat up construction workers, they don't do as well as their jobs at their jobs. They may be unhappy, they may be sick. Right? This is just a, an abstract representation of stuff happening to human beings that the human beings care about. I already said something about risk, but it was purely in the abstract, that story we were telling to each other about insurance. I wanna give you some data or analysis of risk. And I regret to say I have some bad news here. So not only are poor countries facing, on average, worse projected damage, there's more uncertainty about damage in poor countries, meaning they're facing higher climate risk as well. So what's going on here? By the way, this is a relatively recent article from Nature Communications. If we look at rich, well, I, these aren't all rich. Russia's a middle-income country, but Russia, Canada, Deutschland, Germany, Great Britain, Sweden, not only are mean, meaning average climate damage is forecast to be low, there's not much uncertainty. Right? So if we look at Sweden, the average damage estimate for Sweden, and I think this is out to 2100 under probably RCP 8.5, although I don't recall for sure. Anyway, this is a very small damage number and there's very little spread. All these dots are pretty much on top of each other meaning not only does Sweden face a rosy average outlook, there's not a lot of risk, not a lot of variation around that rosy average outlook. If we look in contrast at these countries, we've got China, Brazil, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, the United States, and India. By the way, the US tends to fare much worse in climate projections than other wealthy countries, partly because we are hotter to begin with. But if we look at this set of countries, not only are average damages bigger, we are generally somewhere to the right on this horizontal axis, there's a lot more spread. Each one of these shapes represents a different damage estimate and there's just a ton of variation. India's may be an important case to highlight here. The central estimate, the average estimate for damage in India is big. $86. In case you're wondering, CSCC, country social cost of carbon, this is just total damage expected in that country per ton of CO2 emitted. So these shapes together imply that when we, let's say in Western Massachusetts, emit a ton of CO2 equivalent, we are doing on average $86 worth of damage to India but there's also a lot of risk or uncertainty around that $86 number. This red square model says damage might be something like $10 per ton. If we woke up and we found out we were in that world, that would be a relatively happy world. On the other hand, under RCP 8.5, so that's the business as usual emissions pathway, and one of the models, we end up with India alone experiencing almost $400 of climate damage per ton emitted. 
I don't, I'm not going to pull you on these numbers, but I'd like you to keep these rough magnitudes in your head for the next couple of minutes of our time together. That $86 is a decent number for dan damage in India, but that we could be talking about higher or lower numbers. Lastly, I'll, well not lastly, but lastly in the, the first part of this talk, the economist's view of costs and benefits from abatement, I wanted to say something about justice. This is a, a somewhat hazardous terrain for me to embark on because I am frankly not trained in this, right? I'm not a moral philosopher. Adam Smith was a professor of moral philosophy, I am not. So I'm not going to try and tell you how to think about this, but rather just gesture to some of the issues. Climate damage is proportional, I shouldn't say proportional, is a function of the stock of emissions in the atmosphere. That is, the amount of climate change we get and the amount of damage we suffer isn't just a function of how much we emit this year, it's a function of how much we emit this year and mo all past emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases by human beings. Today's wealthy countries are responsible for roughly 70% of the stock of emissions out there in the atmosphere. I've already showed you that they're not going to suffer very much from all that emitting. Who is going to suffer? Countries that are already poor, already hot. This is a way of illustrating that point. It's using not the share of the emissions stock due to a particular country, but the share of the emissions flow as of 2013. Now this is less good, but we have data on it. Reconstructing historical emissions from let's say England in 1850, not so easy. So the authors are using 2013 emissions and they are graphing them against the share of global damage, global social cost of carbon suffered by a given country. This one-to-one -one line says that a country's, well, sorry, I started that in, in, in not quite the right way. If a country were located exactly on this bolded one-to-one -one line, that would say that its share of 2013 emissions is identical to the share of global damage that it suffers. That is one plausible way to define fair. If your contribution to the problem, at least in one way of measuring it, is the same as the share of the problem that strikes you. If a country is below this line, that means that it emits more than the share of damage it suffers. So we get, not surprisingly, the US below this line, China, in relative terms, in, is emitting much more than it is projected to suffer from climate change. On the other hand, I keep coming back to India, and that's not a coincidence. India today emits very, very little. In the past, it emitted even less, and yet it is forecast to suffer quite a large share of global climate damage. So there, there are very obviously equity and justice problems here. Now, there are a lot of different ways to think about this, but one I am particularly fond of is the John Rawls Veil of Ignorance thought experiment. Has anybody heard of this? The Veil of Ignorance. It sounds mysterious, doesn't it, or occult? If there are philosophers in the audience, you, you, I may make you cross in, in that I'm, I'm about to remove all the subtlety from John Rawls, but the idea is this. Imagine we got all the human beings who are ever going to live together in some sort of mystical room outside of space and time. And all of us, the humans, we, we would have to agree how much emitting we were going to do over the course of human civilization. What do you think we would agree on? How much would we decide to emit if we did not know what place and time we were going to be alive in? That's the crucial thing, and I, I neglected to say it until just a moment ago, the, the, the veil of ignorance part. When we are all bargaining with each other, we have to not know who we're gonna be. I could be a blacksmith in medieval England, I could be an astronaut in the year 2300. But this doesn't necessarily lead immediately to an answer, but Rawls' notion was that the, the choice that people would agree to behind the veil of ignorance, when they don't know which body they're going to inhabit in the world, is the just choice. It's not the only definition of justice, but it's a, a philosophically interesting one. And I would argue that if we were all together behind the veil of, of ignorance, deciding on an emissions path over time for human civilization, 
we would probably choose much lower levels of emissions than we are actually seeing. So that suggests that in a Rawlsian sense, in a veil of ignorance sense, the course we are pursuing is not the just course. But again, different people have different ideas of justice. Let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to say here. I hope you will forgive me for briefly falling back on my crutch in the notes. Ah, yes. The other thing I'll say about Rawls and the Veil of Ignorance is there's a pretty clear implication for discounting. I talked before about a kind of exchange rate between the future and the present. If we want to think about the value in today's dollars of damage that will happen in 100 years, we need some kind of conversion factor. But imagine we're all in, in John Rawls' magical room behind the veil of ignorance, and we don't know what generation we will be alive in. Would we do any discounting at all? Plausibly not. Right? All of us in the, in the magical room, would, if we didn't know what generation we were going to be alive in, we would like then to treat the costs and benefits accruing to each generation as equivalent to each other. A dollar today is the same as a dollar tomorrow, is the same as a dollar 100 years from now. So the, the discounting that is common in climate economy models becomes problematic from the Rawlsian point of view. Now, I am hiding one important detail here, and that is if future people are richer, maybe taking away a dollar from them hurts less in terms of satisfaction than taking away a dollar from us today. But are future people going to be richer? I don't know. The Nordhaus model assumes they will be, and that could be right. It could also be R-O-N-G. Okay, so that, that's what I'll say about justice. Very, very briefly, other limitations of this economic view of the problem, it's anthropocentric, meaning turtles don't get a vote in this thing. Turtles might still matter if, if from a human-centric perspective, I attach some value to turtles existing in the world. We can put that in a standard economic analysis. But turtles, in a, in a typical economist's view, have no intrinsic value. And I realize how morally monstrous that sounds, but I want to be clear about the limitations of what I'm doing here. So there are no animal rights. And economic analysis is less helpful if efficiency is not your goal. I can show you this figure and make some arguments about maximizing the size of the social pie. But what if that's not your goal? What if, for example, you're concerned with maximizing the well-being of the worst off person in society? This figure might still be useful for thinking about that, but it doesn't lead immediately to a policy prescription if that is your goal. Another weakness of a figure like this is that it takes the income distribution as given. So when we think about the benefit of, let's say, uh, avoiding one degree of warming, keep some people alive who might otherwise have died, how do we value those human lives? Economists typically look at how, how much human beings are willing to pay to avoid mortality risk. That is how we value human life. But what goes into my willingness to pay to avoid mortality risk? Part of it is my fear of death. If I'm really, really scared of dying, I'm going to be willing to pay more money to avoid the risk of dying. But crucially, another input to my willingness to pay to avoid that risk is my income. Richer people are, have more ability to pay to avoid mortality risk, and that can lead to richer people's lives getting more value in a model than poor people's lives. Now, not all modelers commit this error because it's obviously morally disgusting. But it's, this is a general problem. It's not just with mortality. If we think about the benefit of avoided malarial disease, for example, these calculations typically take today's distribution of income as given. Why would we do that? Well, it has the virtue of being empirically observable. We can go out and see what the distribution of income in the world is. But that's really the only point in its favor. That's the only special thing about the distribution of income we observe. We have no, at least I don't have any strong reason to suppose that the distribution we see is morally good or inevitable or somehow the most desirable input to a policy calculation. 
I have gone much, much slower than I planned to go, and I'm supposed to be done now, yes? All right, we're, we're going to do the very, very cheap and cheerful version of the rest of the talk. Market-based policies are not working. Why not? This is, these are prices in California's cap and trade market. The yellow dots and the blue line are the observed prices in the cap and trade market. This black line is the statutory floor. So that says that the permit prices are for the most part hitting the minimum set in the law. And not only that, look at these amounts. We're talking about $10, if we're lucky, $20. If I have to pay $20 to emit a ton of CO2, that's equivalent to a pollution tax of $20 per ton of CO2. But if damage to India alone is $86, this tax is way, way, way too low, even if efficiency is your goal. So what do we do instead? We do less politically poisonous things. Pollution tax failed miserably on a ballot initiative in Washington state, so we do stuff like subsidize R&D or subsidize low GHG energy production. Okay. The last thing I'll say, and I'll be super brief about this. So we can try policies economists don't like. We can also engage in various forms of adaptation. The bad news, though, is that at least some of the evidence suggests we're not very good at adaptation. I do want to say different authors disagree on this. I'm only showing you one piece of evidence, but if you think that countries are getting better at adapting, then you would expect this 1990 to 2010 damage function to look less bad, to curve down less sharply than the blue 1960 to 1989 damage function. It's not the case. They look similar. Hot years seem to hurt countries just as much now as they used to. You might think that rich countries are better at adapting than poor countries because they have fancier technologies and more wealth, but the damage curves for rich and poor countries are indistinguishable from each other. So it's possible we'll be really good at adaptation, but at least some estimates suggest we won't be. The very last thing is migration is likely to be a very important margin of adaptation to climate change, and we know very little about it. That's partly because it's highly constrained by politics, and it's partly because we haven't yet hit the degree of extreme warming that might lead to more massive migrations than we've seen to date. This is about the best attempt I've seen so far, and it's quite limited. It's looking at migration within Indonesia in response to year-to-year -year fluctuations in temperature and precipitation. And we see that temperature extremes can increase migration probability by about 2%. Now, baseline migration probability is something much less than 100. So a 2%, sorry, I forget if this is percentage points or percent. Anyway, if I shovel that distinction off stage, I'll just say this. We see people migrating in response to temperature changes already. If we heat up the world by 4 degrees C or 5 degrees C, people may move around a lot. That could be really consequential for human welfare and for our politics, for the structure of our societies. I don't know how it's going to go. There's a lot of risk, and it plausibly matters. So thank you very much for your time, for hanging in through all this. And if you have questions, I'd be delighted to take them. For what it's worth, questions that are, uh, let's say, poking holes in the assumptions of the economics profession are, are appreciated. Yes? You, in the flannel. Um, this is a quick question about the cap and So the cap has been ratcheting down, meaning the total number of permits available in the market is, falls over time in California by law. And here where the permits are on the floor, that suggests that businesses for the most part aren't needing to buy these permits. They're able to do a lot of cheap abatement. And I'm never gonna buy a permit at $15 if I can just avoid the emission for $5 instead. 
But it looks like what's finally started to happen as the cap has got low enough is that businesses, and here we should think of, say, Pacific Gas and Electric, Southern California Edison, cement factories in California, have exhausted, at least some of them, their cheap abatement. And so they're now forced to turn to the permit market and buy permits for the emissions they're not able to avoid. That's a good question. That's a really fundamental, deep question. So in some sense, the question is, let's see. How credible do I think this number is? Or how much probability would I subjectively attach to that damage projection? And well, you, you may have heard this before, but I'll, I'll steal from the great Yogi Berra. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So the, the, only intellectual, the only intellectually honest answer I can give you is, I don't know, and your guess is as good as mine. Now, that's not to say we're in an evidence-free world where all outcomes are equally likely. The, the weight of the evidence suggests that damages are likely to be substantial. But even these authors who would arrive at a relatively pessimistic average guess have some non-zero probability on climate change actually turning out to be positive in income terms. I think if we went and had a beer with them, they wouldn't say climate change is good, but that's not a zero probability. So can I tell you that MIT is not going to project, com not going to perfect commercial scale fusion electricity production? No, surely there is some probability attached to that, but I'm not willing to stake our, the lives of our grandchildren on it. Right, the, the uncertainty and the range of bad outcomes on the table suggest that we should be buying insurance even if there is this small possibility that we get lucky and climate change is a positive, which I don't personally expect, but I'm wrong a lot. Yes, sir. No, that's, uh, that's very well said. I, if you were in a room full of economists who specialize in the firm side of things, they would all be nodding along with you and saying, yes, 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 this makes sense. So I'll, I'll give you two replies, of probably one a bit less satisfying and one I hope slightly more so. The, the first is, the less satisfying reply is that this is assuming away the kind of real world complexity you are describing. There could be a huge fixed cost, that's typically the jargon we use, associated with that first ton of abatement. Could be the politics, could be installation of new abatement capital. And then you could actually have declining 
marginal cost, at least within the plant or within the firm, in abatement. Definitely possible. The, the slightly more satisfying answer I can give is that we sh even though I may have talked about this in terms of one firm, we should really think of this as representing the cost of abatement across all firms in the economy. So imagine this range of the curve is coming from plant number seven, and this is plant number 10, and this is plant number 12. So I, how should I say? I'm not a plant engineer, but I sometimes read things they write. And I, to the best of my knowledge, it is the case that if we compare two different plants, one may have cheaper abatement available than another. But to get a full sense of that for the government is actually very, very difficult. Because if you go to a plant, if you go to uh, an environmental engineer at a power plant and say, how much is it going to cost you to abate? They're going to say $11 billion because they don't want you to pass a law requiring them to abate. That reduces profits. So learning the actual cost structure for abatement within the firm is very, very hard because the firm has no incentive to reveal it to anyone on the outside. Ah, well, this is a really good group of, uh, of questions tonight. Uh, my personal suspicion, founded on, on nothing more than intuition and introspection, is that it, it actually just owes a lot to people's personalities and their normative beliefs. But of course, we ex post rationalize it with, with fancy jargon and intellectual sounding arguments. So if I brought in Nicholas Stern and William Nordhaus. Uh, Nordhaus thinks that we should derive the rate at which people trade things off over time from observed decisions. And that leads us to using a market rate on a risk-free asset as a measurement of, of people's discount rate. The market rate on a risk-free asset, like US government debt, risk-free definitely in scare quotes there, is often something like 5%. And so that's where Nordhaus gets his discount factor. Stern tends to start more from a model of a, an infinitely long-lived social planner. If we imagine there's a goddess, she rules us all, she plans emissions for all of time, and to do so, she requires some discount factor. That usually comes from two things, a pure rate of time preference, just some reason you like today's people more than tomorrow's, and the fact that future people are likely to be wealthier and taking away money from them hurts less than taking away money from people today. Uh, Stern sets the pure rate of time preference, just the goddess wanting to favor today's people, very, very close to zero. But he allows for a little bit of discounting based on projections of tomorrow's people being wealthier, and that's how he ends up at this 1.5 to 2% discount rate. 